I want to thank uh, everybody for the opportunity to be here. I'm, I don't know, I'm a little bit nervous. I like to talk in front of people, but I'm nervous for some reason, so excuse me if I stutter or something like that. Um, I started out here, um, as you can tell, I'm a little bit older than most of the graduate students. In fact, I was figuring out in my Department of Public Administration, I'm probably, there's only like three faculty members that are actually older than I am. <laughs> so um, there we go, right? Um, so uh, I actually started out a long time ago. I actually have a master's degree in molecular biology. I studied and researched gene mapping in mice to understand if we couldn't find a genetic model to identify what genes cause multiple sclerosis. And I have, you know, I have some research publications in there. And, you know, so trained as a hardcore molecular biologist, gene mapper, you know, whatever you want to call me, positivist. It was all about science, and science was the way to do it. Life interfered. Um, and I decided after 17 years in industry that I wanted to come back. But as I remember my experiences in molecular biology, when we talked about that during the, wow, the early 90s, um, molecular biology and genetic engineering was going to solve, we're going to feed the world, we're going to cure all the diseases. It was the panacea that was going to be, it was, it's, we were going we to figure everything out, right? So um, when I came back into thinking about getting a PhD, I, I was like, where are we at? How are we doing? Are, are we there? I mean, I still heard about all these diseases. I still heard about hunger, so it's like, you know, what happened, right? And so as I started, um, as I started looking into this a little bit, all of a sudden I went on a search on the internet and I started seeing pictures like these, right? And I think Fred showed you one of those pictures. You have, you have two really competing ideas behind the use of uh, genetic engineering. And, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about GM foods because that's probably the most well-known case model. Um, but, you know, you have anywhere over here how GM technology has helped things, you know, help the environment, less pesticides, and then you've got what I call Frankenart, which is, which is totally fascinating to me, right? You've got this picture of, you know, really fear-inducing types of things, and you have, I mean, if you look at that from a narrative perspective, you have children eating this damaging cordon in the background. You have government agents and science and all these types of things. So there's, there's, there's some different worldviews going on here, right? And there's some different ideas about what's going on. And so it's like, how do I reconcile all of that? It's really, really confusing to me. And then to make it even more confusing, I went to Mexico, right? And so I was on this trip in Mexico. And I grew up in Twin Falls, Idaho. It's like one of the 50 biggest production, agricultural production communities in the United States. And I saw a guy plowing a field with, a, uh, with an ox. And this blew me away, right? And not only did I do that, I actually went to his house and ate a tortilla at his house, sprinkled some salt and had a Diet Pepsi and ate one of the best tortillas I've ever had, and realized that in this guy's shed, there are 12 to 15 bags of, of corn. And out of that corn, he's going to feed his family. He's going to plant his crops next year. And if he needs clothes or gas or something for his farm, he's going to sell his seeds out of his crop. And that's how he's going to live. And all of a sudden, it hit me, holy crap, this guy doesn't have the money for the technology, he doesn't have the money for the water, for the fertilizer, to use genetic engineering and technology to solve his problems. And all of a sudden, I was going like, I didn't even think about that piece, right? So all of a sudden, I started thinking as I started taking my classes in public administration, what we have here, we like to call them grand challenges. In public administration, we call them wicked problems, right? There are these wicked problems that can't be solved by just going to scientific data. You've got political aspects going on. You've got social and cultural aspects going on. And so that's really what kind of got me into this eye is that I felt like I could investigate some of these types of things, these wicked problems. And so as I started realizing, I, I, so I wanted, I wanted to think, well, what, how did the eye help me through this? And I realized that my view on learning, I'm, I'm not an educational expert, right? But I do teach classes, and I've been trained, so maybe that just makes me d dangerous. I don't know what it makes me, right? But, you know, when you think about learning from, a, from certain perspectives, usually you have some type of mental model or heuristic in mind that when you bring information in, it's usually screened through that mental model, and you make decisions on the data, you categorize it, and do all these types of things. Um, a large part of learning is just not memorizing data. It's actually refining these mental models and saying, hey, here's some new information coming in. How, it, it, it doesn't fit with my normal mental model that I'm dealing with. Is there someplace else out there that might explain this a little bit better, right? And so you refine those mental models. And lots of ways you refine your mental models is through experience, 
but you also can go into research and you can look at theories and you can go look at uh, academic or empirical studies that go out there and help you refine your mental models. And, and as you start refining your mental models and some of this data or some of this information that comes in that doesn't necessarily make sense the first time, as you start refining these mental models, you'll start saying, oh, maybe that fits a little bit more over in this idea or maybe this fits over more in this idea, right? And so you start refining these mental models. The interesting thing and potentially the hard thing to do is is as I'm redesigning my mental models and I'm thinking about something to do, I really need a safe place to do that, right? If I go outside of the dogma or the orthodoxy and start questioning some of these types of things, I might get shut down really quick and I'm not really gonna have a chance to redesign or refine my mental models, right? And so I need a safe place to question, I need a safe place to experiment with my mental models. And from my perspective, that's what the university is, right? Is it's a place to learn new mental models, it's a place to learn new theories, new research, and hopefully it's a safe place so that I can refine and define my mental models and learn to experiment them a little bit. And so I think that's really, when I think about it, that's what the IGERT did for me, is help me do that. And I want to explain how the IGERT helped me through this learning process and how it's influenced my research. Um, so here are my theoretical influences, and I, I realized, I hope Jason forgives me, I forgot to put STS up here, which is actually a huge part. These are all the theoretical influences of all the classes that I've taken. Each one of these classes has had a strong component in the classes that I've taken. That's a huge, that's a huge list of those. You know, my home department is, you know, there in public administration. I probably call myself a really poor political scientist, but I do some political science. The rest of this stuff, this is all stuff that was brought into me through the IGERT, taking all these classes, that history components, entomology. So what this did, from my perspective, is all of a sudden each one of these, each one of these disciplines brings in a different view of the world. They have research, they have theories that all of a sudden I can start saying, oh, you know what? from a sociology perspective, yeah, that, I mean, maybe that makes a little bit more sense, or genetics, like I didn't understand what sterile insect technique was when I got here, right? So I had to take these classes to understand, but all those things started to allow me to create different mental models and refine my mental models. And so this is, this is, this is the piece where, where through the IGARD, I wouldn't have taken most of these classes if I wouldn't have been in the IGARD and it wouldn't have helped my research. So I think that's one of the key things that the IGARD did. The second thing is the IGERT provided me the safe place, right? So this is the safe place where I could sit down and talk about maybe some, some things that are a little bit uncomfortable. And so some of the things that, safe places that I was able to do some of these conversations where we talked, Jen talked about the Mexico trip, some great conversations there. And sitting down and talking to farmers and understanding what's going on and seeing a guy actually plow a field and realize that his, what his corn does and it's so different from mine, we took the GES minor courses together, and that's where I took a lot of these things, and you know, we worked on publications together. I remember working on a publication with Jen and the group, and I wrote like this beautiful like six-page analysis of, of how public policy fits into this, and it got scrapped down to like three paragraphs, and I was just really mad, right? <laughs> but you know, but it, but it made sense in the long run. That's the way, that's the way. It needs. Jen didn't tell you she wrote like about seven pages, didn't even make it in the paper at all, right? <laughs> so, but you know, but, but there was that conversation that we had. It's like, well, we want to include that or we don't want to include that, right? But it was a safe place to have a conversation. We probably left a little heated every once in a while, but we came out with a good paper. It was really good. The second thing we had was the colloquiums, and Fred talked about those. It was to have the people that came and talked to us and the breadth of people that came anywhere from industry people to people to that opposed it to researchers who are actually sitting at the bench doing the work. Um, it, was, it was great and to have those conversations and it was a safe space to have conversations. I, you know, I one time got snapped at a little bit from, from somebody with some of the ideas that I said but immediately you know, somebody stepped up and said that's not the way we do this. We're, you know, we're inclusive and we talk about that. So that's a very safe place to do that. Um, the GES projects, I think I've been involved in four different workshops or colloquiums where I was either a collaborator or presenter or something like that. So again, this safe space where we sit down and talk about gene drives or talk about the genetically modified American chestnut tree or all of these different things where we could sit down and you had social scientists there, you had scientists there, you had industry, all these people made it a really safe place. And then finally faculty, can't say enough about the faculty. I mean, I'm. My faculty, four of the five people on my dissertation committee are actually from, from the GES Center, from the IGERT program, and so 
whenever I have a question, I can sit down and talk to them. So it was a very safe place for me to talk about some of these ideas and not feel like that I was going to get the door slammed on me right away, that we could have a conversation. From my perspective, very, really, really valuable. Okay, so let's talk about, my, I want to talk about my research a little bit. I mean, what person who does research doesn't want to talk about it a little bit, right? So my research is in genetically modified mosquitoes. Again, you see this really strong uh, contrast. So the picture on the, on your, uh, the picture of the normal looking mosquito came from the, the website of the company who developed the genetically modified mosquito. The picture of the not so anatomically correct mosquito came from an organization that opposes the use of genetically modified mosquitoes. When I look at that, there's a story there, right? Something's going on. There's a difference in worldviews. There's a difference in ideas of why, of what they view that mosquito, how they interact with that mosquito, whether they want the mosquito or don't want the mosquito. So my research is around policy decisions around why, whether people decided to release a genetically modified mosquito or not. Genetically modified mosquitoes have been released in Brazil and are unregulated now. They basically can be released wherever they want. In the Florida Keys, they had regulatory approval to release genetically modified mosquitoes. Um, there was such a public outcry around it that they took it to, a, they took it to the public to vote on a non-binding referendum. And in one part of the, in the, in the, the place where the mosquitoes were going to be released, the, the town decided against it. And the county, but where the county where the mosquitoes were going to be released, voted in favor for it. So the, at that time, it was the FDA came back and said, you can't release in the town because they don't want you to. If you want to release someplace else, you got to come back and you have to resubmit your application to release the mosquitoes. Super, from my perspective, a super interesting thing. And so what I study is I study public policy. And I don't, and I don't study policy tools. I study why do, why do certain policies get passed? How do policies even get on the agenda? What, what are the oppositions to policies? What are the reasons why people support certain policies and don't support persons cer certain policies? And so that's what I'm studying with the genetically modified mosquito. And I think you've heard a lot of talk here about the publics. What I'm really interested in is when, when, the, when the rubber hits the road, what do, people, what do people vote on? And I look at narratives, right? So back to, and narratives were originally started as they they were they were originally discussed in in um, in philosophy and English, right? And so I so here I am, a, pol a political science or a public policy person, looking at narratives and the stories that people tell, and how do those stories influence those types of things? And so that's kind of my research. And if you look if you look through there, the influence on my research itself, you can see. You know, I come anywhere from public policy, public administration. I have influences from anthropology, economics, entomology, genetics, political science, and communication. All of these ideas, all of these things that I'm looking at, they all came from my experience in the IGERT. If I wouldn't have been part of the IGERT, I probably wouldn't have understood or even thought to look in some of these types of areas. And so that's why the IGERT has been, has been super powerful or super, super influential for me to allow me to start doing some of these research, some of these research questions. Um, the IGERT, IGERT's been a great experience for me. Um, the, the relationships that I've built, built with people have been, have been fantastic. Um, <laughs> The conferences I've been able to attend and the, the, just the financial resources that have been provided to me has been absolutely powerful. And the sheer fact that I can go every Tuesday at noon and know that I can sit down and have a discussion with a group of people around some topic around genetically modified organisms. And that, that's just not going to be from a scientific perspective. You're going to have all sorts of people in there and it's to be a broad perspective. It's been something that I, I don't think I could ever replace and it's been incredibly valuable for me. Thank you.